this is going to be a huge year for our church. Let me just put that out there. This is going to be a huge year. I believe that we're on the brink of something huge that we don't even understand what we're about to walk into. And, and I'll go ahead and say this, that we're going, to be, we're going to be talking at the end of the service. Pastor Richie's going to come. He has some things he wants to share. And so if you're in the room today, when we get to the end, don't leave. Don't check out early. There'll be food at Cracker Barrel later on. It's fine. You don't have to, to, to get out of here if you're online and you hear Travis come out and the music starts playing. You're like, hey, he's rapping it up. I'm going to go ahead and check out a little early. Don't check out early. We've got something big we want to talk about at the end of the service um, in, in more detail. But I just say this for now, God's got some big things ahead of us this year. And I believe that the next couple weeks as we talk about prayer and we go into a week of fasting, that I believe God's going to do something in the next two weeks to prepare our hearts for what's ahead. And I believe in six months, we'll, we'll look back and we'll say, hey, it, it's because of what happened in those two weeks that we are where we are today because we invited God into it. And God's got a plan, but he wants us to, to ask and to seek him for it. He doesn't need us to do anything, but he wants us to ask for it and to seek him for it. And God's got some big things. I believe, I believe God's gonna give us an Ephesians 3.20 type of year. And you're, maybe you're wondering, you're like, well, what's Ephesians 3.20? You're getting out your Bible app and you're gonna, you're gonna check it out. Well, let me just go ahead and tell you. It says this, now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine immeasurably more. So whatever you're believing God to do in your life this year, he'll do immeasurably more. And I love that word immeasurably. We can't measure the height, the depth, the greatness of what he's gonna do. There's no way to quantify it. Whatever you think he's gonna do, whatever you think he's capable of, he can do immeasurably more than what you can even ask or imagine, and I believe that's what's ahead of us for this year. Do we believe that, church? Do we, because if we don't believe that, we might as well go home. We might as well go home. And the next few weeks are critical, are critical, and I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. And I hope, I hope we're all ready and where we are and where we need to be. And, and hopefully, hopefully if you're not where you need to be over the next two weeks as we talk about this, as we prepare, as we go into a week of fasting and praying and seeking God's face, I hope that you get ready because God's going to do something and we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I've been um, the past few months just reading and studying the life of Elijah um, and it's just been a special time. I've really just been spending time in these stories, reading these stories, and what a mighty man of God Elijah was. And I preached at the beginning of the year a message called Fix Your Mix, talking about Elijah in the cave and how God reacquainted him with his voice and taught him how to hear from him again and how we can do that ourselves in our daily walk with him. And I believe that God has another word for us today from the life of Elijah. And so if you'll do this with me, I know we don't typically do this on a Sunday, but I like doing this because it keeps everybody's attention and focus. Can y'all just stand as we read God's word this morning? Can we just stand? I'm going to read this. It's going to be on the screens. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. We're going to be in First Kings chapter 18. We're just going to read a couple verses here. The story may seem familiar to you, um, but I believe God has something that he wants to show us and encourage us in this morning. And so hopefully if you've got your Bible or your app, hopefully you're ready. I'm going to start reading so we can save time this morning. All right. We don't want to waste time. Wasting time is not good. And so um, here we go. First Kings 18. We'll start in verse 41. It says, and Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. The sound of a heavy rain. Elijah didn't see the rain. He heard the rain coming. And I believe this, sometimes we can sense things coming before we actually see things coming. We can sense God moving before we actually see what he's actually up to. And I believe that for this year. And I don't, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse with that, but I believe God's going to do something this year 
and we're going to look back and we're just going to praise him for it. And so Elijah told Ahab, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. So seven times Elijah said, go back, go back. And the seventh time the servant came back and reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. My title for the message today is Prayer That Perseveres. Prayer that perseveres. Father, I hope you take this word that you've given me. I know you've promised that your word will not return void. And so would you speak today? Would these be your words, not my words? I surrender myself to you. I surrender this time to you. Would you speak this morning? Would you give us a taste of your goodness? Would you give us hope today? And we praise you for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen. You guys take a seat. Prayer that perseveres. How many, uh, how many gym goers do we have in the room? How many people go to the gym? How many people go? Was that a thumbs down? I don't know. Some people are raising their hands. Some people are like, boo, you know, not the gym. How many gym goers? Come on, be proud. Be proud. All right. How many people joined a gym this year at the beginning of the year as a New Year's resolution? All right. All right, here, here, here's where the rubber meets the road. I'm gonna talk over here because I don't think anybody over here raised their hand. How many are still going to the gym even though you got the membership at the beginning of the year? All right, all right. So that's the point, right? We don't, we don't, we go to the gym to get in shape, right? We go to the gym to strength train, to, to produce endurance, to get healthy. And so, but going to the gym once does not produce results, Right? Going to the gym twice does not produce results. We have to keep going. We have to keep persevering. We have to keep going. It takes time. It takes discipline. It takes determination. And that's why a lot of people aren't going to the gym anymore, right? And so because we start, we get the membership, we get the discount, we get the promo package at the beginning of the year. And then come January 14th, we're not, the gym's the last thing we think about, right? At the, at the beginning of the year. But those that stick with it, you can tell a difference after an amount of time, Right? It, it takes time. It takes time. And so here's the sad reality. I'm going to hit your heart out of the gate this morning. Here's the sad reality. A lot of us spend more time persevering in the weight room than we do in the prayer room. And I know you're probably wondering, man, that's kind of hard. That's kind of hard right out of the gate, you know. Uh, you're kind of hitting me between the eyes right out of the gate. But that's the sad reality. As believers in Jesus, we spend more time persevering at the gym than we do in our prayer life. And, and, and what, what happens is, is we go to God and we pray and then nothing happens and we assume, well, maybe God didn't hear us, you know, or we assume maybe I didn't say the right thing, whatever the case. We've all experienced these times where we've gone to God and we've prayed for a breakthrough only to get a blackout. We've prayed for a breakthrough and all we get is a blackout and it's like God didn't hear us, God didn't answer the prayer. And what we'll see today is we'll see Elijah practicing prayer that perseveres. He went to God and he prayed and he didn't see results right away, but he, but he kept praying. He kept pushing. He kept going. And then God moved. And so Elijah knew how, how to exercise his faith. He, maybe he didn't go to Planet Fitness, but he did know how to practice perseverance in his prayer life. And I hope today that, that God will show us some things from his life that we can learn, that we can adopt into our own life when we don't see God moving, when it doesn't seem like God's answering. It's not that he's not there. It's just he functions on a different timetable than we do. 
And so when, when Elijah faced the resistance and, and nothing seemed to be happening and nothing seemed to be moving, Elijah kept praying, he kept persevering, and he saw God move. But before we get into the story, into the text that um, God has for us today, I want to give us a little bit of background on what's happening in the story, because it's always good to know when, when we look at these stories in the Bible, we kind of know the context around what we're actually studying. And three years earlier, Elijah had gotten a word from the Lord that a drought was going to come in Israel. And a drought was gonna come because the nation had substituted the worship of the one true God for false gods. And, and King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, you may, may recognize their names, they had even set up uh, idols to worship in the temple for Yahweh. They had set up temples or set up idols to these false gods and because they had done this, God sent a drought on the land. And so then three years later, God gives another word to Elijah and he says, hey, I'm going to end the drought that Israel's been going through. And it says this, if we put this up on the screen at the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 18, it said this, after a long time, how many ever experienced a long time, a long time of waiting? You've prayed, you've sought God, and you waited a long time, a long time, three years, three years Israel had been in a drought. But after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. God gave Elijah a promise. He gave him a word. He said, I'm gonna send rain on the land, but there's something you gotta do first. And the story that follows as Elijah goes and presents himself to Ahab, it might be one that we're familiar with, but here's what happens in a nutshell. Elijah goes to Ahab and he says, hey, I need you to assemble all the prophets of Baal, all the, all the prophets of the false gods, we're gonna meet on Mount Carmel. And so they meet on Mount Carmel and there's a showdown that takes place there and both sides come together, they, pre they prepare altars, they prepare sacrifices and Elijah says, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll even let you guys go first. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pray to our gods. We're gonna pray to our gods. You can pray to Baal. I'm gonna pray to, to Yahweh, the one true God, but you guys can go first. And so they put the sacrifice on the altar and they, they prayed and they, they prayed to their false gods and nothing happened. It says they even cut themselves. You know, they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff and Elijah's over there. He's even taunting them. He's like, well, hey, maybe, maybe he's in the bathroom. You know, maybe, maybe he's asleep. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe shout a little louder. Maybe he doesn't hear you. And so they go on and they go on and they go on and nothing happens. And so then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah, he puts the sacrifice on the altar and he even takes buckets of water and he pours it on the, the sacrifice. And if you're gonna call for fire from heaven, water is probably not the thing you wanna put there. Maybe you wanna put gasoline there to give you a little bit of help. But no, he said, hey, I'm gonna prove that this isn't about me. This isn't about me that I'm gonna prove that God is God. He is who he says he is. And so he soaks the altar, he soaks the sacrifice, and then he prays and fire falls from heaven the first time. He doesn't even have to wait with this prayer. It happens right away. God answers the prayer, fire falls from heaven. And then Elijah goes on and he slaughters all these pro false prophets. They're all dead. They're all dead. He kills all of them. And so then... Then, after the showdown, Elijah tells Ahab, I can hear it. I hear the sound of the rain. It can come now, because we've dealt with the problem. Now that the worship of, of Baal had been dealt with, the drought could come to an end, because here's, here's, the, here's the first thing. Here's the first thing. Israel's drought was caused by distraction is because they were distracted with false gods that God sent the drought. And so Elijah had to come, he had to deal with the distraction. And so before Elijah could pray, he knew he had to remove the distractions. And that's the first thing for us this morning. We have to remove the distractions. See, Israel has started to put their dependence on sources other than God. And when you start to put your dependence on any other source than the source, God will cut you off. He will cut you off. 
He will cut you off. When you start to depend on anything other than him, he will cut you off. And he does it because he cares for you. And I know it might sound mean that he cuts you off from your life source, but it's because that he cares for you because he knows that he is the one thing that you need. We, we go through life and we think we need a lot of things. You know, we, we, we order a lot of things on Amazon we think we need, but there's only one thing we need and it's God. And we, yeah, yeah. And when we start to put our dependence on any other source other than him, he will cut you off. And that's what he did to Israel. He cut them off. He cut them off. And some of you, you're in a drought today. You're in a dry season today. A dry season of the soul. It doesn't necessarily mean your, your business is failing or your marriage is failing because here's the thing. Sometimes what your, your outward situation can be a lot different than the condition of your soul. And so today, some of you, you're in a drought. You're experiencing a drought and it's because you've gotten distracted. You've gotten distracted by your work. You've gotten distracted by a relationship. I don't know what it is. It's different for everybody. But see, here's the thing. God uses the drought. God uses the drought to bring on desperation. Because when you're in a drought, when you're thirsty, what do you want? You want something to drink. You want something to quench the thirst. And so God knows if I can cut off the water supply to Israel, if I can put them in a drought, they'll return to me because I'm the one that provides the water source. I'm the one that provides the life. And if I can make them desperate enough, they'll return to me. And what God does is when he sends us into a drought, eventually we get so desperate for God that we'll do whatever it takes to remove those things that are distracting us in our life. And that's the beautiful thing about a fast. And so as we prepare for, uh, not this week, but next week, as we prepare for this fast, here's, here's what I want you to be thinking about and praying is, is God, what do I need to remove in my life so that I can hear from you? What is it? What distractions? What things are distracting me from your purpose for my life that I need to remove? If, if but for a week, if but for a week, just to remove from my life so I can focus on you. God, I wanna hear from you. God, God wants some people that are desperate enough to hear from him. And if you're desperate enough, you'll do what it takes to hear from him. And so once Israel's distraction was removed, they heard the sound of the rain coming. And I'll tell you this, if you go into this, this week of fasting and you do what it takes to remove the things in your life that you need to remove to hear from God, you'll hear them. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. You might not see it right away, but you'll hear from him. You'll hear from him. And so once Israel removed the distractions, once they removed the false gods, they could hear the rain coming. So let's pick it back up. This is the story that we're looking at today. There in 1 Kings 18, we'll start with verse 42. It says, so Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. He told his servant, go and look towards the sea. He told his servant and he went up and looked and there was nothing there, he said. And seven times Elijah said, go back. So here, here, here's the story. Here's the picture. Um, they deal with the false prophets and then immediately when he hears the sound of rain, I love this, there, there's two reactions here, right? There's Ahab and then there's Elijah. Ahab says, hey, this is awesome. I'm gonna go eat. And Elijah said, I'm gonna go pray. <laughs> it made me think sometimes we in church, when we hear from God and we sense rain, there are some people that go home and they pray. There's some people that get so focused on what they wanna eat for lunch, that's all they think about when they leave church. But if you're desperate for God, if you are hearing from God and he's speaking to you and you're hearing what you will do is you will go home and you will get on your face and you will process what God is telling you. And so there's two reactions here. Ahab, he runs off to go eat. Elijah, he climbs to the mountain and he gets on his face before God. 
and he starts praying. And, and he, he does this weird thing, right? And I'm not going to act this out because sometimes I act things out and they take pictures of me and they put it online and they poke fun at me for doing awkward poses on the platform. And so I'm going to resist the temptation today to do what Elijah did and bend down and put your face between my knees. I don't do yoga. And so I, it probably would not end well. It, it, something probably would snap. Something probably would tear. And we don't want that because, you know, that just wouldn't be good. Nobody deserves that. And it's even recorded online for all of eternity. And so we don't want to do that. So I won't act it out. But Elijah goes and he puts his face between his knees and he starts praying. And he tells his servant, he tells his intern, you know, to put it in our, you know, kind of frame of thought in our context. He tells his servant, he says, hey, I'm going to pray and I need you to go up there. I don't know how far it was, but he told him, he said, I need you to go up there and look out towards the sea and tell me what you see. And so Elijah starts praying. He's in his awkward little pose. He's going for it. He's praying. He's pressing in. He's asking God and his servant takes the trip and he's probably gladly taking the trip. It's the first time he's expecting probably to see something really awesome. And he goes up and he looks out over towards the sea and, uh, hey, it's it's nothing. And so he, uh, he goes back and he probably doesn't want to tell Elijah that nothing's happening. You know, this man just killed uh, over 400 people, you know, and so he just slaughtered them all. And so now he's got to go back and tell him, hey, I know you're praying. I know you're a man of God. I know you're a prophet, but uh, mm, nothing, nothing's there. Nothing's happening. And so I picture this, I picture Elijah, he's over here, he's praying. I don't, I don't even think he looks up. He just says, go back, look again, look again, go back, go again. And so his servant says, okay. And so he, he makes the trip back up, you know, he, and he takes a look and still nothing. And so this time he comes back and tells Elijah the, the second time, hey, the, the, man, there's nothing there's nothing there. I don't know. Maybe you need to, to mix up your strategy. Maybe you need to say something a little different. Maybe, maybe you need to shed some tears. I don't know. Something needs to change because nothing's happening when I go back up there and Elijah tells him, go again, go again. And this is the part that we all can relate to, right? We, we, we go to God in prayer and we ask God to move. We ask God for um, a, a move of God. We ask him to answer a prayer. We ask him to heal a loved one and nothing happen, happens. And so we've all experienced times where we have to pray and wait. And that's our second point for today. We need to pray and wait. See, praying's easy, right? We can make the, make the prayer list. We can, we can go to God. We can ask for things. But then when it comes to waiting, that's the part that's a lot harder. Praying's easy. Waiting's a different story. Waiting's a different story. See, we, we, uh, we, we don't like to wait as a culture. In fact, we're a culture and we're a people, we like to invent ways to not have to wait. Right? And so we had these things way back in the day called restaurants that you would go into and you would eat. And then we got smart and we put our heads together and we said, hey, why don't we do this thing where we prepare the food ahead of time? And then when people can come in, it's already made. We can just put it on a tray and we called it fast food. And then we said, hey, this is, now we're having to wait too long. Even, even going in is too much. So we invented this thing called the drive through so now we don't even have to get out of our car. We can just pull into the parking lot and we go up to this window and we give them the money and they give us our food and we go on with our day. And then we decided that, hey, the drive through is taking too long. So let's invent this app where we can put our order in. And when we get to Starbucks, we just drive up to the window and it's already ready and we don't have to order. We don't have to wait uh, for, from the time we, we talk into the little bun to the time we pull up to the window for our food. It's already ready for us when we get there. We are a culture that likes to invent ways not to wait. That's how much we hate waiting. We, we invented a thing called Amazon Prime. And we put an order in and two days later it shows up. Well, at least it used to. Now, now they tell us that COVID keeps the, keeps the package from coming on time. And then they invented this thing called within an hour you can have what you order on Amazon. We're, we're professionals at coming up with ways to not wait. 
We used to send letters, we used to make phone calls, and then we made emails. And then they started pushing emails to our phone because we couldn't wait to get back to our computer. And so now they push the messages to email on our phone. And, and then some of us were like, email is too slow. And so now we're just gonna text people. And how many people have ever done this? You pull out your phone, you text somebody, and then what do you do? Where are the bubbles? Where are the bubbles? <laughs> What's going on? What are they doing? It's been six seconds and they're not replying. They're not even reading my, what is happening? I hate waiting. I hate waiting. And we all hate to wait. And sometimes we go to God and we pray for this. We pray for that. And we expect it to show up next day air. God doesn't work that way. God works on a different timetable than we do. We can't invent a way to make him respond faster. We have to pray and then we have to wait. We have to pray and then we have to wait because God functions on a different timetable than we do. Isaiah 55 says this, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. If we had it our way, we would pray and God would answer the first time we ask. And sometimes I think we think we're entitled to that. We go to God and we treat our prayer request like a grocery list. Hey, I need you to do this, I need you to do that, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And then we wake up the next morning and it doesn't happen and the package doesn't show up on time. We're trying to get on customer service with heaven. Hey, it didn't show up on time. God's like, I didn't promise you it would. Sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes you have to wait. And Elijah knew this. He understood this. He had been around the block a time or two. He knew God. He was close with God. And so when he sent his servant up the mountain to go look and his servant came back and he said, hey man, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. I don't see anything happening. Elijah said, go again, go again. He even, he even said it seven times. He'd come back, nothing's happening, go again. He'd come back, this, the, all the way, seven times, go back, go back. He probably came back after this sixth time and he was probably super frustrated. I would be, I'd be frustrated. Man, you keep sending me up this mountain to look out at the ocean and nothing's happening. And you're just sitting here, <laughs> and you're just sitting here. And, and, and I don't know what you're praying, but you must not be getting it right. And so seven times he said, go back, look again. Still nothing, go again. Still nothing, go again. Here's the thing, God's looking for some people that will be willing to go again. That will be willing to go again. When you don't see the answer the first time, go again. When you don't see that breakthrough the first time, go again. When you don't see that miracle happening, go again. When you pray for someone to be healed and you don't see it happening, go again. God's looking for some people. It doesn't matter if it takes seven days or if it takes seven years. He's looking for some people that will be willing to go again, to keep asking, to keep pressing, to keep persevering, to keep asking. Keep knocking. That's what Jesus said. He said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and that door will be open to you. But if you notice, then never did he give a timetable. Never did he give a promise of delivery. He didn't give you a, 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 a time to expect your package to be delivered to your door. No, he just says, I need you to ask and I need you to seek me and I need you to knock. The answer will come. I, just, I can't tell you when. I can't tell you when. But my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And some of you, you've been praying and you've been looking and just like Elijah's servant, you don't see anything happening. And the next day you pray and nothing happens. And it seems like every time you pray, man, I just don't, I don't think this is doing anything. And the sad reality is that sometimes we just give up. We just assume, well, man, we must not be close enough with God. He must not really care about me. He must not hear me. And we pray and we see nothing happening. 
And, and I, think, I think this was probably a learning time. I think Elijah probably kept praying. He kept persevering. He didn't look up every time his servant came back. He just said, go again. And I think after the sixth time, I just picture Elijah looking up and this is a, a mentor moment for his servant. And, and, and this isn't even in my notes, but, but here's the thing. Sometimes God will put people in your life to witness your waiting. He'll put people in your life to watch and to learn. So when they come up against the time where they have to wait, well, now I know that it doesn't always happen right away. And so he pulls his, he pulls his servant over and he says, hey man, I know you keep going up that, that mountain. And I know it looks like nothing's happening. And you keep coming back and you say, nothing's happening. But son, here's the thing I need you to understand. The God that I've come to know, the God that I've come to worship and have a relationship with, he don't do nothing. God don't do nothing. And if there's one thing, if there's one thing that I can leave you with today, that if you don't take anything else away from this, there's three words that I want you to know. And I believe God's saying this to somebody today. It's never nothing. It's never nothing. And so he pulls his servant aside and he says, hey man, I know it looks like nothing, but it's never nothing. With God, it's always something. With God, he's always up to something. He doesn't sit idle. He doesn't sit by. He's not on vacation. He's not asleep. He hasn't forgotten about you. He's not trying to be mean. He's not a bully. He's up to something. It just might look like nothing, but it's never nothing. It's always something. Every time you pray and it looks like nothing's happening under the surface, God's moving. Under the surface, he's working in your situation. He's working something out. He's up to something. He's up to something. He, he's, he's working in your waiting. He's working when you're praying. He's working in all things. He's working all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. He's working while you're waiting. He's working in your chemo treatment. He's working. He's working in your unemployment. He's working, he's working something. It's never nothing, it's always something. I need 10 people just to give God praise today because it's never nothing, it's always something. It's always something. God's always up to something, he's always working. And even when it looks like nothing's happening, he's working. And he's working to make your faith stronger. Isaiah 40, 30 through 31 says this, and we sang it earlier. You're gonna know this because it's gonna look like we're putting the song back up on the screen. But here in Isaiah 40, it says, even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted, but they that, what? Wait, come on, come on. I need more than four and a half people to, to say it. Those that Wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's what I love about that song. It's, it's not some clever lyric that someone else wrote. It's what God wrote in his word. If you wait on him, if you wait on him, if you wait on him, if you keep praying, if you keep persistently seeking him and asking and knocking, he will make your faith stronger. He might not instantly give you what you think you want, but he will give you what you need. And that is more of him. He will make your faith stronger. All we have to do is pray and wait. And uh, just gonna share a little personal story here really quick, and then we'll close this thing down. Before, we, before Christina and I showed up here at Avalon Church, we, uh, we moved to Georgia from South Carolina, and um, I did a residency at a church in Alpharetta. And I had friends, 
that when we were going through that process of moving here and we went into the, the program and um, about halfway through, you start preparing because the, the goal is not to stay there, right? Anytime you do an internship or a residency, it's to prepare you for what's next. And, and so we knew that this was just a temporary stopping point on a greater journey. And, and I remember when we went there, we had friends that told us, they said, hey man, God, God's hands on your life. God's, God's gonna put you somewhere and it's gonna be great. And man, we've, we've had people come through these programs before and sometimes it takes a long time to get them placed in a church and um, where God wants them to be. But with, hey man, it's not gonna be a problem with you. It's not gonna be a problem. We're gonna, we're gonna get this thing done really quick. As soon as the program's done, you'll have a job. And um, that's funny thinking about now because when it was over, we had to wait another year and a half. <laughs> We had to wait longer after than we did the whole time we were in the program. It was only 11 month program. And then we had to wait another, you know, 18 months. But God was faithful, God provided. He gave us a place to stay. He gave us a family here in Georgia that let us live in their basement for free. Let us eat some of their food. And I remember during that time, I remember going to God and I'm like, God, what, what in the world? <laughs> what in the world? There, I could probably count on one hand the amount of days that went by that I didn't pray. God, would you give us what's next? What are we doing? <laughs> okay. I even thought, I prayed, I said, God, do you want me to get a job? And he said, no. He said, I want you just to wait. I want you to wait. And I, and I had people that, that spoke into my life during this time and, and they would tell me, they try to encourage you, you know? And I remember people, I forget even who it was, they told me, they said, the right place is out there. It's just, you gotta wait for the right timing. The person that has the job you're gonna step into, I remember them saying this, the person that has the job you're gonna step into isn't done. God's not done with them yet, but when he's done with them yet, he'll open the door and you can walk through. Don't miss what God's doing in the process. The, the man we lived with at the time, he said this, he said, don't miss the purpose in the process. Because it's, what's God, it's what God is doing right now in your life as he's preparing you for what's next. That's what it's about. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And I remember our first Sunday here, <laughs> Remember our first Sunday here, we were sitting right there about where Robert is. And uh, we were sitting there and that was the Sunday that Parker was announced that he was leaving. And I remember sitting right there and I, I, I thought and I remembered what that person had told me. <laughs> There's a place God has for you, but the person that's there is not done yet. But when he's done, God will open the door. And I remember sitting right there and witnessing that. And God taught me so much, so much. Those 18 months of praying, thinking that because of how good I was, because of what people thought of me, that this was gonna be easy, that, that this was gonna be a no brainer. I didn't pray nearly as much before the 18 months as I did when I was in the 18 months. Because that was the point. That was the point. God wanted to get my attention. He's, he was telling me, this isn't about you. This isn't about your skill and ability. This is about me. This is about me. I'll share my glory with no man. No one will share my glory. This is about me. I'm gonna put you where I need you to be and you're not gonna have anything to do with it. It's gonna be me. And some of you today, you're waiting and you're praying and you're asking God to do something and it seems like nothing is happening. But let me tell you this, you don't want that answer to come prematurely. You may think you do, but you don't, you don't. Because I look back over those 18 months, we visited a lot of churches, we interviewed at a lot of places, and we thought every time we went that that was where God wanted us to be. We we're so stoked about it. This is awesome. And now I look back and I'm like, thank God. <laughs> thank God I didn't end up there. 
Because if it was up to me, I would have settled. But God said, I've got a place for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a higher calling for you. I know you think you know what you need, but all it is is something that you want. But what you need is where I have for you to be. But I had to wait. I had to wait. I had to wait. Prayer is easy, but waiting is difficult. But it's the waiting that transforms us. It's the waiting that makes you into the man, the woman, the father, the mother, the coworker, the boss that God wants you to be. It's in the waiting. It's in the waiting. Last verse, James 5, 16 through 18. James is talking about Elijah, and this is really where this message launched from. It says this at the end of verse 16. It says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. And if it were up to us, if it were up to us, we would have left off that last part. It says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. <laughs> the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. As you're waiting, as you're persevering, as you're in the grind, in the day to day, and you're seeking God, the power is in the waiting. The power is as he's working it out in you. So what are you praying for? What are you praying for? Just two questions for us today. What are you praying for that you're tempted to give up on? But what you need to do is keep going and go back. And when you don't see the answer, go back again. When you don't see the answer, go back again. Don't give up. Second question, are you distracted today? We live in the age of distraction. We are inventing ways every day to distract us more and more. And it is the worst thing for our spiritual walk. It's the worst thing. So what are you distracted with? What distractions do you need to remove going into this next season? God's got some things he wants to do in your life. He's got some things he wants to do in this church, but we will never do it if we're distracted. So what is it? What is it? Some of you need to leave today and you need to go home and you need to pray. God, what is it that you want removed in my life to have room for you? What's distracting you? What's distracting you? God's got some things he wants to do, but he needs a church full of people that will pray with perseverance, that won't give up. I'll keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. God, we thank you today. Thank you that you don't just give us what we want. You give us what we need. And we have to wait for it. And so today we wait in your presence. We ask you to move, Lord. We ask you to move. God, would you be over the next, next couple of weeks, may we not get distracted even by what the future holds, but may we be focused on the here and the now and what you're doing to prepare us for what's ahead. But God, we focus in on you over this next week and the week after as we go to you and we fast and we pray, God, would you show us what it is you wanna do? And we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.